Greetings, everyone. I am Vince, and with me is Mona Lisa, and we will be discussing Aristotle's book entitled The Nicomachean Ethics. For today's lecture, uh, we will be discussing three books, which serves as an overview of his of this ten books worth of uh, explaining his philosophy with ethics. Now, to start with. Aristotle was the first Western thinker to provide philosophy into branches which are still recognizable today, such as logic, metaphysics, natural philosophy, philosophy of mind, rhetoric, and especially ethics and politics. Now, he was born in Stagira, a city of northern Greece, in 384 before Christ. Now his father, Nicomachus, was a doctor at the court of Amintas of Macedon, who preceded Philip, the conqueror of much of Greece. Now Aristotle later served as a tutor to Philip's remarkable son, Alexander the Great. Now, Aristotle's writing has a certain terse elegance, and it is ideally suited to the presentation of arguments in which his philosophy abounds. Now, the works opens with a discussion of happiness, then moves to the moral virtues, the virtues of character, including justice, and to the virtues of intellect. It also discusses pleasure, and its role in the basic role in the best life, returning to a further discussion of happiness. Now, the first part of the Nicomachean ethics talks about the human good, in which what we humans want in every scenario, story, and action. Now, in this chapter, uh, in, in the chapter subject of inquiry, Aristotle stated that in every art and in every inquiry, and similarly, every action and choice is thought to aim at some good. Now, every aim is declared to be directed towards some good. But a certain difference is found among ends. Now, some are activities, others are products apart from the activities that produce them. Now, the difference is found among the ends, that's what I've said a while ago, apart from the different actions. Now, according to him, the nature of the products is better than the activities. Uh, time and efforts have been rendered in order to attain uh, the end product that we seek to be good. Now, according to Aristotle, we have here a, somehow a flow of idea where one um, has or one conducts activities, applies some actions to it, and that action, and with that action, it, it creates product. Now, sample of this is, let's say, in, in our field, we have activities like uh, building drawings, creating drawings, applying some actions, uh, which means that um, I, uh, bringing the drawings in the real world, where we have a product of a two-story house two-story residential house. We also have here a uh, bangta making as an activity applied with action and we have an added product which is a, a, a fully functioning bangka. We also have here a, uh, activities like uh, when our parents planned our um, childhood with some music activities, applied some action, applied some practice, training, and a product of a musical score or a performance can be uh, produced. Now, the next uh, same chapter of the subject of inquiry talks that the science of the human good is politics. Now, Aristotle links ethics with politics, suggesting that the highest good must be something that is common common uh, to all the people in a political community, or let's say in a uh, uh, a just community. In other words, the highest good must be a shared goal. A while, uh, a while ago, the highest good must be, uh, in every action, we are considering the good of it, the, the, the human good. Now in, now, in this case, the highest good must be a shared goal, 
that unites and guides the actions of individuals within a society. Now, it serves as an outline and the process in aiming what we are seeking in every ad of things we do. Politics appears to belong to authoritative art. Yes, authoritative art, which is truly the master art according to Aristotle in a way that it legislates as to what we are to do and what we are to abstain from. For in the end of this science must include those of the others within the community, within the political community, so that the end must be the human good. Now, next, um, we have here a statement that if then there is some end of the things we do, which we desire for its own sake, and if we do not choose everything for the sake of something else, clearly this must be the good and the chief good. Now, uh, for all the things that, that we do, you know, uh, we desire for its end, whether definite or not. Now, we can somehow relate this to Newton's third law of action, which is action and reaction. Let's say we are studying hard for the sake that we will graduate and finish school, finish college. However, if we are doing things freely without taking consideration of its end, or let's say an open ending story, we still are looking forward. Uh, at, we know that at the back of our mind, we want to finish school. We want to, yeah, we, we just want uh, our studies to be finished and reach that goal. Uh, we are still looking forward to a good ending and the chief good. Aristotle defines the chief good as the highest good or that which is the ultimate end of human action. Now, uh, we have here, uh, yes, diagram of that. We, we certainly want to reach that ultimate goal, that, uh, that ultimate end of human action, which is the highest good. Now, let's proceed to the next chapter for the first book, which is the nature of science. Now, statement, now each man judges well the things he knows of. These he is a good judge. And so the man educated in the subject is a good judge of that subject. And the man who has received an all around education is a good judge in general. Now, uh, the statement, uh, Aristotle asserts that ethics is a practical science, not just a theoretical one. It is uh, concerned, somehow concerned with creating human behavior and making practical judgments that aims to determine what is the highest good for humans. Now, ethical knowledge is distinct from theoretical knowledge and uh, requires practical wisdom to apply moral principles to real life situation. Next chapter, we have here the human good. For, uh, the, for this statement, which says that in view of the fact that all knowledge and every pursuit aims at some good, what it is, what, what it is that we say, political science aims at and what is the highest of all goods achievable by action? Now, Aristotle proceeds you know, to explore the, the concept of human good, which he defines as the ultimate aim of all human actions. Now, he introduces the idea of eudaimonia, often translated as happiness or uh, flourishing as this highest good. He argues that everything we do for the sake of this good and the ultimate, and gives purpose to our lives. Now, as you can see here, we have here the highest of all goods, which equates to eudaimonia, or as defined in the book, the happiness. Now, while well, happiness is probably the best English word to translate eudaimonia, the term also carries connotations of success, uh, fulfillment, and flourishing. A person who is eudaimon, Eudaimon is not simply enjoying life, but is enjoying life by living successfully. Now, we uh we have 
we we constantly think that we call people good if they perform their function well. Now, for instance, uh, let's say, uh, isang tao magaling siyang tumugtog ng gitara. No? Uh, playing the guitar is the guitarist function because that is his or her distinctive acti activity. Now, the distinctive activity of humans generally uh, is our rationality. Therefore, the supreme good uh, should be an activity of the rational soul in accordance with virtue. Now, this definition aligns with popular view views of happiness, which see the happy person as virtuous, rational, and active. Now, if goodness is seen as pleasure or happiness, then actions which are performed for the sake of honor, benevolence, justice, or other virtues may be judged as good because they bring pleasure and happiness. Yes. So for the sake that uh, if goodness is seen as pleasure or happiness, uh, other or other virtues now may be judged as good because they bring, again, pleasure and happiness. Now, for the last chapter of book one, we have here the kinds of virtue. Now, we have here the statement, since happiness is an activity of soul in accordance with perfect virtue, we must consider the nature of virtue for we shall see the better the nature of happiness. The true student of politics is thought to have studied virtue above all things, for he wishes to make his fellow citizens good and obedient to the laws. Now, in this statement from the book Aristotle discusses, uh, he distinguished two kinds of virtue, which is moral virtue and intellectual virtue. Aristotle says that moral virtues are not innate, but they are acquired by developing the habit of exercising them. Again, exercising them. Now, an individual becomes truthful no? by acting truthfully or becomes unselfish or uh, generous by acting unselfishly. Naman. Now, Aristotle notes that it may be difficult to, for an individual to become virtuous if he or she has not acquired the habit of acting virtuously. If, let's say, uh, gusto mong maging mabait, pero hindi ka naman uh, nagpa-practice na maging mabait sa kapwa, sa klase. So, di mo pa rin makakamit yung, yung trait na maging mabait. Kung baga ganun. Now, for example, no, it may be difficult for an individual to become tactful if he or she has not acquired the habit of acting tactfully. It may also be difficult for an individual to become unselfish if he or she has acquired the habit of acting selfishly. Now, on the other hand, man, let's go to the uh, intellectual virtues, which according to Aristotle, intellectual virtues are the excellence of thinking and use of reason. Now, the intellectual virtues are acquired by teaching, which is a skill, a way of living, something that can only be learned through experience. Now, this is the summary for the first book, which is The Human Good. Again, um, this is the main concepts no, that Aristotle wants us to know, where first one is all human activities aim at some good. Second one is that uh, eudaimonia or happiness is the highest form of all goods achievable by action. And Third one, ethics is a practical science, not just a theoretical one. And last, but not least, we have here two types of virtue, which is the moral virtue and intellectual virtue. Now, let's, uh, the, uh, while we go to the second book, let us focus on the moral virtue. Uh, and let's talk about it uh, more. So, oops. Again, for the second book, we have here uh, uh, Moral Virtue. And um, yes, we eh, pinakita to kanina. No? And as a continuation to the second book, 
uh, Aristotle said that there are two types of virtues, again, the moral virtues and intellectual virtues. Now, um, moral virtues include courage, temperance, self-discipline, moderation, modesty, and justice. Well, intellectual virtues include scientific knowledge, um, artistic or technical knowledge, intuitive reason, practical wisdom, and philosophical wisdom. Now, uh, we are all born with the potential to be morally virtuous, but it is only by behaving in the right way that we train ourselves to be intellectually virtuous as well. Now, as a musician learns to play an instrument, we learn virtue by practicing, not by thinking about it. So we put an action to it. We put an, uh, an effort to it right, in order to learn that virtue that we want to learn. Now, uh, let's proceed to the first chapter of the book too, which is the moral virtue. And how do we attain it? So the first statement uh, says that a morally virtuous action, action requires an individual to be able to choose how to respond to his or her own thoughts and feelings. Thus, the concept of moral responsibility implies that an individual has some freedom to choose his or her own actions. Now, we have here um, the moral responsibility determinants, where uh, moral responsibility uh, may be partly determined by whether the action is voluntary or involuntary. That's number one. An individual may not be morally responsible for having performed an action if the individual, again, remember this, was forced to perform the action against his or her own will. An individual may also not be morally responsible, let's say, in the uh, responsibility that if ever siya ay may, uh, if siya ay walang control sa action or sa activity. That's number one. Now, moral responsibility may be partly determined, again, by whether an individual prior to performing an action was aware of the possible consequences of the action, which is this number two, second term. Now, morally responsible, moral responsibility may also be partly determined um, by whether an individual should have known the possible consequences of the action. Now, last but not least, uh, moral responsibility may also be partly determined if um, an action is impulsive or deliberate. Impulsive actions may be voluntary, you know, but may not be purposeful and planned as deliberate actions. An individual may have a responsibility to control his or her impulses, but the individual who acts impulsively may not be as aware of the possible consequences of his or her actions who acts um, impulsively. So that's the case for the moral virtue um, and how do we attain it. So for the next chapter, we have here a statement, the genus of moral virtue is not a, a passion nor a capacity. It is a state of character. Now, according to Aristotle, virtues are neither passions or capacities as it is a state of character. We are not called good or bad just because of uh, passions and our feelings. Feelings are meant to be felt. Yes, feelings are meant to be felt as if we don't have a choice. Similar to passion, we are also not called good or bad simply because of our capacities to experience and feeling the passions. Now, at what state, since cancel man yung ang thought ng passion and capacities, no? Now, at what state does virtue needs? Aristotle, therefore, inferred that the virtue of man will also be the state of character which makes a man good and which makes him do his own work well. Again, um, uh, the virtue of man will also be the state of character which makes a man good and which makes him do his own work well. 
So for the last chapter, I mean, sorry, uh, we also have here you know, the concept of the intermediate where the difference of moral virtue is a disposition to choose the intermediate. Now in everything that is continuous, it is uh, possible to take, or, or let's say in every thought, no? or in every uh, in every concept that is continuous and divisible, it is possible to take more, less, or an equal amount of the thing itself that is uh, relative to us. And the equal, let's say the between, is an intermediate between excess and effect. Now, I will explain to you what excess and defect means in, in, in Aristotle's um, definition of moral virtue. So, we have here a diagram where the it shows the relationship between defect, intermediate, and excess. So, Aristotle meant that being intermediate from the object or from a concept no, is equidistant from each of the extremes or from the fact and excess, which is one of the same for all. Now, the term intermediate symbolizes the concept of moral virtue. So moral virtue uh, means inter means being at the middle or you are the intermediate level. No? So for it is concerned with passions, related to some moral virtue, the term intermediate symbolizes the concept of moral virtue for it is concerned with passions and actions. And in these aspects, there is excess defect, which are the extremes, no? which are the excess. Now, for instance, both fear and confidence and appetite and anger and pity and in general pleasure and pain may be felt both too much and too little. Now, and in both cases, not well. But to feel them at the right times with reference to the right objects, towards the right people, and with the right motive, and in the right way. Yes, that's the goal. And in the right way, it is what is both intermediate and best. And this is the characteristics of being the middle or... or, or it is the right thing to do uh, at the right place at the right time. Now, considering all those activities, all the passion, uh, your feelings, your thoughts. Now, parang mahirap sa hindi ano. Na mas malalaman natin na if we dive into the extreme, no, the the concept of intermediate and its relationship to the moral virtue. Now, there are three kinds of disposition. Two of them are vices involving excess and deficiency. So we have here defect and excess. Uh, and one, a virtue, which is the intermediate. So the extreme states are contrary both to the intermediate state, or second na, or some other virtue, and to each other. So basically, uh, contrary lahat sila. Kaso, mas, mal mas malakas yung uh, contrary aspect ng both extremes or ng defect and excess compared sa, sa contrary between the intermediate and the one of an excess. Ay, one of the extremes. So, you see, intermediate to excess and intermediate to defect. Now, um, for example, for the brave man appears rash relatively to the coward. Now, let's say a brave man is the intermediate, which is, that is the moral um, moral trait of a man, moral, um, yes, the moral trait of a man, which is oh yeah, the moral, like, um, as a nice man, well, to be a brave man, that's a nice trait. No? So for the brave man, appears rash relatively to the coward or to the defect, which is the lesser um, extreme. So parang coward ang tingin, I, I mean, for the coward, rash tingnan ang brave man. Bale. 
bale bale ko ako, ako yung coward i see i i interpret the pre man as a rash or parang um uh, uh, and which is the extreme no rash rash na term now um uh, it is also relative uh to the concept that the brave man is coward for the rash man let's say the brave man intermediate para sa kanya kasi siya yung gitna and the rash man is the highest para sa kanya coward yung brave man when it is compared to him now uh this is just an example of a uh, visualization no? that Aristotle explained in his books na on uh, how moral virtues plays as the middle ground between extremes whether it could be an action an attitude and a passion and how we think we act and etc so it is basically um we we are looking at uh, the relativity na here no so um iba yung iba yung point of view ng defect to the intermediate iba rin sa intermediate to access and as well as iba rin yung point of view sa tawag nito both of extremes now so that's it for the second book of uh, the Nic the Nicomachean Ethics which is the Moral Virtues let's proceed to third book which is Pleasure I'm I'm in book 10 Pleasure and Happiness so let's start off with uh, uh starting with the book 10 Pleasure and Happiness so finally on this book we differentiate what pleasure is and to what happiness is. So while pleasure and happiness is often interchanged, actually, uh, uh, pleasure is hedonia. If the happiness is eudaimonia, uh, pleasure is hedonia. So it is a sensory experience or feeling of satisfaction that arises from fulfillment of desires or attainment of certain goods. Unlike pleasure, happiness is not just a momentary feeling, right? So, pinag-iisipan ang happiness. Uh, we have a build-up of our character, of our virtues. But pleasure is a momentary feeling. It is a comprehensive and enduring state of living in a virtuous and fulfilled life for happiness. Moreover, for this difference, pleasure... For it is thought to be most intimately connected with our human nature, which is the reason why in educating the young, we steer them by the rudders of pleasures and pain. It is thought to that to enjoy the things we ought and to hate the things we ought has the greatest bearing of virtue of one's character. For these things extend right through life with a weight and power of their own in respect both to virtue and to a happy life since men choose what is pleasant and avoid what is painful and in such things furthermore there are two treatments for pleasure according to uh according to us or according to humans so it is good according to eudoxus and thoroughly bad but pleasure is not inherently bad or good its moral value depends on its connection to virtuous actions and activities. Arit Aristotle does not endorse the conclusion that pleasure is good. Perhaps he rejects the assumption that pleasure is a single thing. So pleasure is a single thing while accepting that all living things aim at pleasure. Therefore, Aristotle identifies two broad categories of pleasure, which is the bodily and sensory and intellectual. So he argues that bodily pleasures, such as those derived from food, drink, and sensory indulgence, are lower value and are often associated with excess and interference. These pleasures, he notes, are short-lived and can lead to undesirable consequences when pursued excessively. Uh, notice that when pursued excessively. So conversely, intellectual pleasures, particularly those arising from pursuit of knowledge, wisdom, and contemplation are considered superior. So uh, the same with the happiness, it has superiorities. 
So Aristotle contends that these intellectual pleasures are more enduring, noble, and virtu uh, virtuous. They are derived from the exercise of the highest human faculties, including reason and intellect. These pleasures, according to Aristotle, are self-contained and do not depend on external circumstances, making them more stable and less prone to excess. So moving forward, Aristotle argues that the pleasures of contemplation align with the highest human virtues and lead to the most virtuous and fulfilling life. He suggests that the pursuit of wisdom and the intellect pleasures associated with it are integral with the with achieving eudaimonia or the highest form of human flourishing. So uh, next, so the pleasures of contemplation again align with the highest virtue of human. So moving forward, we have here the happiness. So this chapter entitled The Happiness is the culmination of Aristotle's ethical inquiry in the Nicomachean Ethics. Aristotle recaps that the essential characteristic of happiness is outlined as happiness is an activity lacking in nothing desirable for its own sake and self-sufficient. And why is it again self-sufficient? Because uh, happiness is an activity of the soul in conformity with excellence or virtue. It involves in the exercise of rational and intellectual capacities, particularly through contemplation and the pursuit of wisdom. Thus, the happiest life is the one that engages in intellectual and contemplative activities to the fullest extent. While we get through the rationality, thus everyone get happiness. So there are people who for Aristotle cannot access this definition of happiness. In a chapter 7 of Book 10, he stated that no one assigns to a slave share in happiness unless human life. Aristotle's insight here highlights the unfortunate re reality that individuals in a state of servitude such as the slaves were not typically afforded the conditions necessary to achieve eudaimonia. They were denied the freedom and agency required for moral and intellectual development. Aristotle's statement underscores the social injustice inherent in the system that deprives certain individuals of the ability to pursue a, ver a fully virtuous and flourishing life. So furthermore, this is because they do not have the autonomous choice which is required for happiness to make it self-sufficient. Uh, quote and quote, since slaves do not enjoy a life of the activities that constitute happiness, they cannot be held to be happy. A uh, more obvious reason is it might be they don't have the autonomous choice, but the happiness requires this remain unstated. So this serves as a reminder of the ethical importance of equality, justice, and the recognition of every individual's potential for moral and intellectual growth. From a modern uh, perspective, it raises questions about the fundamental rights and opportunities that should be extended to all members of the society to enable them to pursue their own happiness and flourishing. So Aristotle's statements can be seen as historical, uh, historically reflective of the inequalities that existed in his time, prompting us to consider the importance of creating a more just and equitable society today. So summing up the Nicomachean ethics, it is about the process of happiness. Aristotle has defined it from the build up, rooting it from the human good to holding it with our virtue to defining it in a bro uh, broader spectrum beyond individuality by having rationality and intellectual wisdom that is applicable in modern times. So this uh, Nicomachean ethics is essential in decision-making for ourselves and also the people surrounding us. So I guess that's all for our report about the three books of the Nicomachean ethics by Aristotle. Thank you very much.